All right. Uh, let's open up to Acts chapter 6. Scott, you need to stick with the Bible. Stop worrying about Clemson, Carolina stuff. I think, it, I think the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Not bring in profane discussions on the Sabbath. <laughs> Carolina could lose every game from now till I die, and I would still be a Carolina fan. So, no worry. All right. Acts chapter 6, uh, Sam kept it, I guess, relatively brief to not go into Scott's time. Scott kept it relatively brief to not go into my time, and nobody's following me, so I guess that means I have all the time that I want. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that your word is not just a a magic vaccination, but it's something we're supposed to intake daily. No matter the time, no matter the season, no matter the decade, no matter our knowledge or our abilities, you've given your word to all your people that they may become like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would help me. Sam, obviously, as a pastor, has his burden that he shares continuously that always comes through in his preaching. Scott is different and unique in the gifts and abilities and burdens and callings that you've put upon him. He was a missionary, and now he's a missionary through our church. But, Lord, I'm not Sam, and I'm not Scott, and to pretend to be either one of those men would be sinful for me. So I pray, Lord, that as they've shared their individual burdens, I pray, Lord, that I would share mine, as different as it may be. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today is December the 29th. To make the story fit, I want you to pretend that it's December the 30th. But let's go back in time a little bit. December 30th, 1842, in a place called Dundee, Scotland, there was a 29-year-old pastor named Robert Murray Machane. Robert Murray Machane. And in, on December 30th, the last, I believe that was a Sunday, I think, on the last Sunday of 1842, that 29-year-old pastor stood before his congregation. Little did he realize it and little did they realize it that it was the final New Year's Eve message that he would give. And the point of that message was this. He stood before those people, this 29-year-old pastor, and he said, my burden for you, now I'm putting it in modern English, but he said, my burden for you is that we might devise a plan where as a church we can go through God's word as a body corporately. Well, he didn't realize that on March 25th, same day as my mom's birthday, on March 25th, 1843, at 29 years old, he would die. No wife, no kids, no lineage, but he left a legacy that remains going into the year 2020. Now you say, Tony, that name means nothing to me. But if you were to get it tonight on the internet, on Google, on Alexa, on Bing, on Yahoo, and on whatever else there may be out there, and if you were to Google 2020 Bible reading plans, up near the top, you would find, even though it was made in 1842, one of the most popular Bible reading plans today was made by that 29-year-old pastor who died at 29, the Machine Bible Reading Plan. Now you may say, Tony, what does that have to do with the youth ministry? Some people would say nothing. I'm here tonight to tell you it means everything. Now, Sam asked me yesterday morning, to, he had this idea that me and Scott would help him out, and he asked me yesterday to prepare something that would be kind of a, a message, a challenge for the parents and the youth ministry and things such as that. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, all right, if I had one chance to stand before our church one time, what would I tell them we need to do more of? Sam has told you we need to be at church more. Scott's told you we need to witness more. And I'm here to tell you we need to be in the Bible more. Now, I don't say that in any kind of arrogant way. I say that because just as God has given Sam a burden that he has not given to anyone else, and just as God has given Scott a burden and a calling that he has not given to anyone else, 
I believe that we're all unique individuals, no matter what the church title is in front of our names. And I believe that the burden God has given me to remind us, because I have to remind myself 25 hours a day, 8 days a week, 32 days a month, 53 weeks a year. That's Clemson math, forgive me. I have to remind myself to be in God's word continually. Because if I'm not, I can tell it in my soul and in my spirit. So, I could tell you that we're going to a hockey game on January the 10th. Be here at 4.30. The sign-up sheet's in the back. I could tell you that we're going to go to Fort Bluff somewhere around the, the middle of July 2020. I could tell you that I'm still trying to maneuver the, the youth camp thing, get that situated. I could tell you, and it would be a lie, that I'm thinking ahead to things in February. My mind does not work that far ahead. But if I had one thing to tell you, what would make the youth ministries and the youth leadership better if we were in God's word more faithfully? Now, to show you that that's not just Tony Walker talking, but it's a a biblical basis, I think I asked you to turn to Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, I'm just going to give you two two simple points. Both start with an L. Leaders, those who are leading, and those who are learning. Those who are leading and those who are learning. First of all, those who are leading. The Bible says in Acts chapter 6, verse number 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, that's a good thing, there arose a murmuring, that's a bad thing, of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So the non-Jewish people, they were murmuring against the Hebrew people. Why? Because their widows were neglected in the daily, D-A-I-L-Y, in the daily ministration. So in the early church, the widows uh, were taken into the care of the church financially, and they, their needs were met on a daily basis. All right. So there was a murmuring happening because some of those widows were neglected on a daily basis. Verse 2, then... The twelve, the apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them. They had a church business meeting and said, Now I want you to think about this. If a leader stood up today in 2019 and said these words, It's not our job. Oh, man, could could you imagine that? If a church leader stood before a church and said, Yeah, I know this, that, and the other needs to be done. But you're talking to the wrong person. That's what they said. It is not reason that we should leave the most important book in this world, the Word of God, to do what? And serve tables. All right. Now, I'm not stopping on verse 2 because I can see how most of y'all are looking at me. I'm thankful right now I've been here 25 years, and hopefully y'all know me better than the way you're looking at me. They came to the apostles, and they said, you have got to do something. The widows aren't being fed. That is a legitimate problem. Let's, let's go to the other extreme. You have got to come to us. This or that or the other is going on with the orphanage home. This, that, or the other is going on with this ministry or that ministry. And I'm in no way, no way putting down any legitimate ministry. No more so than the apostles are here in Acts chapter 6. But they said, we have one responsibility. And what is it? We are not going to leave God's word. Now, what he did not do is say, all right, I'm going to sit here. You do something about it. Come back and tell me when it's fixed. That's not what he did. So let's see how verse 3 connects to this. Wherefore, that's a connective word that connects verse 2 into verse 4. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, number one, qualification, Number two, full of the Holy Ghost. Number three, full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. All right? Church leaders, there's a problem going on. Oh, man, I hate to hear that. What can we do about it? Well, we want you to do something about it. I appreciate your confidence, but then I would have to leave what God has called me to do to do what God has called you to do, and then neither one of us are doing what God has called us to do, right? And so then what they do is this, all right? Those in the congregation, you know the congregation better than the leaders do because we see them once a week, you see them every day. You know things that we don't know. So you find seven, yeah, you find seven men who fit these qualifications 
and you bring them to us, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to use the word ordain. Whom we may appoint over this business. But verse 4. While that is happening on a daily basis, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. On a daily basis. Because the problem was a daily basis, remember? So the problem was happening daily. They said, we need the church leaders to fix it. And the church leaders said, we can fix it, but you're going to help carry the load. We're going to do what God has called us to do. You're going to do what God has called you to do. You tend to those ministries on a daily basis so that daily we can have uninterrupted access to the throne of God. And then after we've heard from God through prayer, then we can carry that same uninterrupted focus, that same single-minded focused train of thought from the throne of God to the Word of God. Now, you know, we live in a day where that does not fly in most churches. I got a hangnail, preacher. Come, come pray for my cat. Come, come handle this, preacher. And I just don't get the impression from Acts chapter 6 that that's the way things went. Now, after they said this, I want you to notice the response in verse 5. After they laid out this plan, what did happen? What happened in verse 5? This is a miracle. This is an absolute miracle. This would be a bigger miracle than Carolina next year winning the SEC championship. <laughs> and the saying... You do that, we'll do this, you handle that every day, we'll stay here with the, with, in prayer and God's word every day, verse 5. And the saying split the church, no. And the saying made a faction that was worse than when it started back in verse 1, no. An absolute miracle of a body of believers unified by the Holy Spirit. And the saying pleased the whole entire every single one of them, multitude. Now, why was that? So that the leaders of the church could every day in 42 A.D. and in 2020 A.D. give themselves to the Word of God. So number one, Tony, if I could tell our church anything Knowing I had one chance in about 10 to 12 minutes, one thing, what would it be to impact the, especially the youth-related ministries of the church? It would be, Tony, get in God's word more than in 2020 than you were in 2019. Now, I'm not preaching to y'all right now. I'm just letting you listen in to the conversations I have in my, in my office here in the week. What I need to do more next year than I've done this year, I need to be in God's word more. Man. Say, Tony... If you're in God's word more, what's going to happen to the kids? The same thing that will happen in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9. The saying will please the whole multitude. Why? Because parents will say, huh, my kid's learning about the Bible. My, my, My little daughter and little son aren't killing each other on the way home after church. They're talking about what Aaron told them about this book Tony showed them that they're going to start going through on Wednesday nights in Discovery that takes them in 52 weeks from Genesis to Revelation, connecting the Old Testament and the New Testaments, and showing that the book is one story, not a bunch of individual stories. What would happen if the leadership of the youth ministry, starting with me, spent more time in God's Word? God would be more glorified. Now, that is not only for the leaders, it's also those who are learning. And let me just make a little side note. Obviously, that includes all of us who are still learning. In Acts chapter 17, it shows us that being in God's word on a daily basis is not just for the leadership of the church, but it's for everyone. In Acts chapter 10, excuse me, Acts chapter 17 verse 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Listen to what it says about those, those in Berea compared to those in Thessalonica. These were more noble in Berea than those in Thessalonica. Why? And that they received the word. Well, to receive it, there had to be some people studying it. 
They received the word with all readiness of mind and listened to what average, down-the-earth, common people in the church did and searched the scriptures, listen, look at that word, daily, whether those things were so. The last thing you need to tell your teenagers to do is say, believe whatever Tony Walker says. Do not do that. They'll end up being Gamecock fans. <laughs> the last thing you need to tell your young people is to take every word I say as the gospel. You know what I would really appreciate? Not if these children one day say, Tony, I've clung to every word you said and I took it without a doubt. You know what would be better than that? When I say turn to Acts chapter 29 and they open up and say, no, Tony, there's no Acts 29. We know because we're checking up what you said. Or, more accurately, this verse says this, and then I quote it wrong, and then a young person tells me after class, no, that's not what it said. That's only happened a couple times, and that was in an adult Sunday school class where someone brought something wrong that I said to my attention and politely, humbly, meekly corrected me on it. That is not a bad thing. That's how you prevent cults from forming. When these people search God's word on a daily basis, what happens? What's the result? Verse 12, therefore, many of them believed. So what is the ultimate end of somebody saying, I'm going to spend more time in prayer and more time in the word of God? It's not so that they can shun everybody and be a, a sloth and a recluse and hold up in a corner somewhere. It is so that they can spend such life-transforming time with God that when they speak to people, those people say, wow, that person's got God on them. And then they hear that and they say, but he's still a human. He can still sin. I'm going to take what he says and fact-check it according to God's word. And you know what you have? Over a generation of that happening, what God intended People being built, young people, teenagers being built up in the faith. I'm going to close by telling you something that I did one day. Well, I say one day, um, probably over a period of, of a few weeks. Um, Y'all remember, I don't know if you do, that, that little hospital I had stay back in February of 2018. That was a, a Valentine's Day to remember, uh, opening up a a hospital tray of hamburger steak there in the ER where Rachel's sitting next to me saying, no, nah, I'm not hungry, I'm sorry. Um, Sam graciously told me to take some time off and get some rest after that. Uh, what did I do? I was back in my office studying. And there on my computer, I made a spreadsheet. I'd seen different Bible reading plans. You've got the Robert Murray McShane plan. You've got read through the Bible in a year plan. You've got read in the Old Testament in the morning, read in the New Testament at night. But I don't know about y'all, um, this is a little bit easier to read John than it is Numbers. Anybody else? It's a little bit easier to read uh, Revelation than it is uh, Leviticus. Sad to say, but, it, but it's true. And that's not a knock on the Bible, that's a knock on me. So I found that the best way to digest the whole plate is not to eat the steak, then eat the peas, then eat the carrots, then eat that thing you're not really sure what it is, and then come back around. The best way is to get a little bit at a time. And so what I did over a period of a little bit of time after I had that hospital stay, Sam gave me some time off, is I made, and hopefully this doesn't mean I'm going to die in three months like Robert Murray Machine, be a final going away party, is I made the, the Walt, Tony Walker Bible reading plan. And what that does is that takes into account that some days we don't do as much as we should compared to others, if you're like me. And if you get behind in a Bible reading plan, it's real easy to chuck the whole thing like February 2nd and then just give up. And so what I did is I devised a way where you take the Old Testament, let me give you some South Carolina math now, 929 chapters in the Old Testament, you subtract 151 chapter, 181 chapters from Psalms and Proverbs. And what that leaves you with is all the Old Testament books minus Psalms and Proverbs and that means two Old Testament chapters a day you can read through the Old Testament in a year. That's how you can start your morning, maybe. What do you do at lunchtime? You read through one psalm, and then when you finish psalm, you read through one proverb a day. 150, 31, that's 181, multiply it times two. What that does is on your lunch break, that takes you through the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs twice a year. 
How many chapters do you have in the New Testament? 260, which coincidentally coincides with how many work days there are in a year if you work a five-day work week, Monday through Friday. So that means that you could read two chapters in the morning from the Old Testament. You could read a psalm or a proverb on your lunch break, and before you go to bed five times a week and take two nights a week off, you could read a chapter in the New Testament, and you could read through the entire Bible in a year by setting aside about eight or nine minutes in the morning 30 to 45 seconds on your lunch break, and three or four minutes before you go to bed. Now, Gethsemane Baptist Temple, if I said in 2020 I want every single one of you to read, read through the Bible next year, you would say, like everybody would respond, I don't have time for that. But according to how much time we all spend on Facebook, do we, do we have eight minutes in the morning? Do we have 45 seconds on our lunch break? I've seen people look at their phones going down the road that long and not even lift their eyes off. Uh, you, you, you could read through Psalms and Proverbs driving down the road. No, I'm joking. And then Monday through Friday, read a chapter of the New Testament, take off Saturday and Sunday because Saturdays and Sundays are busy. And what if, what if somebody come to me on December 29, 30, 31st, 2020 and said, Tony, I listened to what you said that last Sunday night of December, and for the first time in my saved life of 40 years, I read through, cover to cover, the book God preserves so that I can know him. If that happens, that would be a blessing. If you start it and don't make as much progress as you intend, worst case scenario, we read more of God's word than we would have had we not set out to do anything to start with.